Good morning. We are coming to you live from Studio 223 in sunny Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm here with Martin Zender, and it's time for a little Q and A. Q and A. I've got the Q. Hopefully, you've got the A. We'll see. Here we go. We did not talk about any of this beforehand on purpose because we wanted to be wanted to be completely spontaneous. Yes. So Martin has not heard these questions. And he's not looking ahead to the answer sheet. First question. <laughs> the suspense is killing me. I lost First it. question. You got it back. I got, got it back. Here we go. You have so many great answers to big questions about God. What are some of the things about God that you have questions about? Um, I'm a detail man. Uh, I have questions about what things look like. I mean, I'm completely satisfied that God has everything lined up. I'm completely satisfied that he has our best in, in mind and that what we're going to see, what he has in store for us, the glory is going to be mind-bogglingly great beyond anything we can apprehend. My only question would be, can we get a little video clip preview, you know, of what we're coming into? But, uh, yeah. yeah. Second question, where do you agree or where do you disagree with A.E. Nock? Oh, that's a great question. A. E. Nock is, of course, a great teacher that you and I both respect. And I do have, and people have accused me in the past of like, you just, whatever Nock says, you agree with what Nock says. Mm -hmm. But that's just not true. I am with anybody. Even the Apostle Paul said to check up on him. And they were the, the Bereans of Paul's day who were noble, and they looked up what Paul said. So I, I disagree with A. E. Nock as far as the basis of fellowship. Nock has a book on the basis of fellowship, and he has actually said that fellowship is not to be based on doctrine. It's to be based on behavior. And I think that is ridiculous because, of course, Nock was... Um, he was... I think the reason he believed that is because at one point he was dis fellowshiped by the Plymouth Brethren. And I think that bothered him so badly and it hurt so badly that he decided that he never wanted to disfellowship anyone because of teaching. But what teaching is the foundation of what we believe, that Jesus Christ died and rose, that's teaching. And, and so what common denominator do I have to fellowship with somebody who believes, say, in eternal torment or that God has lost control of his universe verse or that Jesus Christ died and is dead well, do I have fellowship with somebody who believes that Jesus Christ is dead so I definitely no we don't so fellowship is to be based on on belief on teaching on doctrine definitely disagree with knock on that and another big thing I disagree with him on is that when the book of life is consulted at the great white throne a e. Knox says that everybody is condemned and that no one's name is written in the book of life and I disagree with that. And that, that's a case where A. E. Nock took, he has three translations, right? A. E. Nock basing his concordant literal New Testament on three ancient manuscripts are the Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, and Codex Alexandrinus. And two of the three manuscripts have, and each were judged in accord with their acts, judged. Only one manuscript had uh, condemned. And it's the it's the small small difference the difference between the Greek word krino, which is judged, and katakrino, which is down judged or or condemned. And that this is important because if everyone who is being judged at the great right at the great white throne, if that passage in Revelation 20 said, and each were condemned in accord with their acts, as A. Enoch has translated it here in the Concordant Version. Now, that's true Then nobody's name is written in the Book of Life, and everybody goes to the Lake of Fire, which is the second death. We still believe in the same outcome, that these people are eventually uh, delivered from death and come into the life of Christ. But why take a translation that only one of the manuscripts uses? Why take that when you have two of the three manuscripts say judged and if you have judgment instead of 
condemnation, then you have room for people's names being written in the book of life. And then you have room for people then being transferred to the new earth from the great white throne. All right. Thank you. Next question. What clues, if any, does the end of the first death give us about the end of the second death? Well, I don't know if you mean to ask the question that way. The end of death is death will be abolished. Are you, do you mean the first death itself? What clues do I get about the second death from the first death? Or what, what do you mean by the end? I'm confused by the question. The first death is thrown into the lake of fire. Oh, death is thrown. Okay, yeah. Okay. Does that give us any clues? And the first death, it said, gives up those that were in it. Does that give us any clues? Actually, it says Hades gives up, I think, those who were in it. So Hades is the invisibility, right? Just those who could not be seen before because they were dead are... I think we have to consult the scripture. We might have to consult the actual scripture, time, which we actually have that technology. We, do you want to go there? Yeah, let's go there. Well, do you have a verse reference for me? Uh, Revelation 20. Yeah, Revelation. It was Revelation 20 somewhere. 14, 15, somewhere around there. 14 and 15. Uh, Revelation 20, starting with verse 13. And the sea gives up the dead in it. And death and the unseen give up the dead in them. This is all figurative. And they were condemned, each in accord with their acts. This is that verse I was saying that I disagree with A. Enoch. They were condemned each. But that word, is it should be judged. They were judged each in accord with their acts. Not It's not automatic condemnation. I just can't let go of the last question. Um, and death and the unseen were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So let, let me reword the question okay. now that you have it right in front of us. Good. Death and Hades give up the dead that were in them. Is it fair to say that because that happens, we can say the second death will give up the dead that are in them? That is in it. Um, we can't uh, get that from that passage. I mean, we believe that's going to happen, but we can't prove it from that particular we can't passage. make that jump and say it's no. scriptural, but can we look ahead and possibly say that could be a possibility? Because we know death is abolished. That's the that's what I was just going to say. We need the death is abolished verse. Yes. We need 1 Corinthians 15, 26 to prove that the second death will be abolished. I know what you're asking. You're asking, does the fact that the first death is giving up the dead into the lake of fire, which is the second death, does that suggest that the second death will also give up its dead someday? Yes. Well, we know that will happen, but we don't have evidence of it from that particular verse. Okay. We're left asking. And th this is why I like to say Revelation is not the end of... Because even at the end of the book of Revelation, we still have death in operation. I mean, the very last passage of this book, near the last passage in unveiling chapter 22 um we, we we have the those terrible people that are still in the lake of fire um let the injurer injure still let the filthy one be filthy still outside are the curs the enchanters the paramours the murderers the idolaters everyone fabricating and fondling falsehood that's like the culminating <laughs> statement of Revelation 22. But actually we know that death will be abolished, but you can't get it from that passage. Okay. What do you think of these arguments against eternal torment and annihilation? If the penalty for sin is eternal torment, Jesus should have been eternally tormented. If annihilation, also known as eternal death, is the penalty for sin, Jesus should not have been raised from the dead, but remained forever dead. Uh, that's, that's true. That's a good argument that people do say that the penalty of sin is um, e eternal torment. And then at the, the same breath, they say, well, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for sin. Therefore, Jesus Christ should be eternally tormented. So that is a good argument against eternal torment and against annihilation, because is Jesus Christ alive yes well i guess if annihilation's the penalty for sin he didn't pay it is jesus christ being eternally tormented no he's at the right hand of god well i guess eternal torment isn't the penalty of sin 
The penalty of sin is death. And Jesus Christ died. It doesn't say eternal death. It just says death. He died, and by his death, he conquered death for all. Not sure the mechanics of that, how death conquers death, uh, but he tasted death for all. And then I guess the key to that thing is he rose from the dead. Without yeah. that, we're screwed. Right. The death of Christ is important, but the resurrection is even more important. So we're not screwed. So that's my conclusion, <laughs> which I'm glad you brought that up. We're not screwed. Good news. You are not screwed. If you spoke at the funeral of an unbeliever, what would your message consist of? <laughs> That's a great question, and I've actually done it before. Um, I spoke at the funeral of my own mother, who was an unbeliever. So, nice. great, great question. Yeah. Um, I emphasize the resurrection of the dead. Without fail, I will go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, a great funeral passage for anyone who has the unfortunate duty to speak at a funeral of an unbeliever, especially of a loved one. This is the exact, this is what I give. Flesh and blood is not able to enjoy an allotment in the kingdom of God. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Um, and then Paul goes on to talk about us, the body of Christ. You can't use that verse. Um, so you'd have to go to verse 54. Swallowed up was death by victory. And what we were saying yesterday, 1 Corinthians 15, 55, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? So I will also go to 1 Corinthians 15, 22. As an Adam are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified, yet each in their own class. And that Christ is the promise of resurrection. I point... Even with a believer, I'll point to resurrection as, as future. So the one common thing, this is helpful, the one common thing that uh, an unbeliever and a believer has at death is they're both dead. Mm -hmm. So the resurrection is future as much for the, the believer whose funeral I'm speaking at, which I've also done, and the unbeliever. They're both screwed apart from resurrection. So I just tie in on death being an enemy and that Jesus Christ will abolish the enemy someday and that I like to emphasize it depends on the people listening I don't always emphasize that the dead have rested from their labors and there's no more pain no more sorrow no more grief I think I, I have said that that could irritate some people because what they want to hear at least those whose loved ones are believers is that their believers are in the arms of Jesus which they're not. Mm -hmm. But that could be bad news at, at a funeral. I hate to bring you the news. Yes, I'm an evangelist, but I must tell you, your loved one, there was no evidence that your loved one believed in Jesus Christ. Therefore, your loved one is now suffering in hell for eternity. The flames are even now crawling up the legs, torso, licking at the face, and they will be there forever, and their torments are just beginning. Go, go in peace now to love and serve the Lord. I'm told that there will be refreshments uh, at the home of Mrs. Smith, and um, we'll all hope to see you there. Yeah. In Hebrews 7, 9 through 10, it speaks about Levi tithing to Melchizedek while he was in Abraham's loins. Can we say that Jesus existed eternally in the Father's loins before he was brought forth? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you can tell how smart somebody is by the caliber of their questions. Read that one more time. I need more time to think. I'm, I'm, I'm stalling. I, I, I'm getting this from Hebrews 7, 9 through 10. Yeah. If Levi tithed to Melchizedek while he was in Abraham's loins, can we say that Jesus existed eternally in the Father's loins before he was brought forth? Not literally. Figuratively. Yeah, not literally. He did not exist. I mean, it was almost a ceremonial thing. Uh, Melchizedek tithed Levi. In other words, he tithed, the, he literally tithed Abraham, who was the grandfather of Levi. Right? Abraham, Isaac, no, the great-grandfather of Levi. So, in a figurative sense, Melchizedek tithed Levi. It would be a figure of association where Levi is being associated with Abraham because he would be follow after him. Your question is, could it be said that we can speak of Jesus Christ as existing? The, the word I 
stumble at with your question is eternally, eternally existing. No, because someone could say that we eternally exi exist. We came out of God also, right? So why stop with Jesus Christ? You could mm -hmm. say, did we eternally exist with God? Well, you can say that we were in God's mind. I mean, you could, the whole creation was latent in God, right, before anything came out of God, including Jesus Christ, including us, including, you know, that, that painting back there. It was in the mind of God right there. Or I can't point there, right? Right. Uh, but no, it didn't eternally exist. It didn't actually exist. We did not exactly, and Jesus Christ did not exist until the day he existed. But we were all, I like to say, latent just like Levi was latent in Abraham, and Eve was latent in Adam. Did Eve eternally exist in Adam? No. She didn't exist until she was created by God. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a stickler for terminology. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. What scripture or scriptures give us the best definition of Eonian life? Um, yeah, people have run this past me because they don't think I mentioned this enough. There's a verse that this is the only life to know the one true God. I think Jesus said that somewhere. This is life Aeonia, and he explains it. I don't know where this verse is. You can't, ex you people can't expect me to memorize the whole Bible, can you? I don't it's John know. John 17. Texts. It's John 17? Yeah. All right, well, give me the verse. Two and three. John 17. So I, I gave the right answer. That's the one you had written down. Yeah. All right. John well, 17. Well, I, I didn't know if there were other scriptures that came to your mind when you... Well, let's go to this one first, because that's the first one that came to my mind. John 17. Now, John 17, 2. Well, let's start with, yeah, verse 2. That thy son should be glorifying thee according as thou givest... I hate this king. Why did not... This is one other thing I disagree with A.E. Not. Why did you preserve... The freaking King James language. Listen to this nonsense. Glorify thy son that thy son should be glorifying thee according as thou givest him authority. Why? Why? That's where they spoke in 1611. It ticks me off, honestly. But it sounds so eloquent. Yeah, it's, it's so spiritual. I'm going to say it like normal people would. Glorify your son that your son should be glorifying you according as you Give him authority over all flesh that everything which you have given to him, he should be giving to them. That's complicated enough without adding the ests and the ists yes. and the ets and the vows that he could give with even life Aeonian. Now it is Aeonian life that they may know thee, the only true God, and him whom thou dost commission. Jesus Christ. So um, I am more of a literalist. I don't really like to go to this first. I figure that's where you might go because most people challenge me with that. It's like, no, this is, Martin, you say that Aeonian life is living during a certain time periods, during time periods. Yes, that is literally Aeonian life. And you and I were talking at breakfast that um, even people who enter the kingdom eon as mortals, they have Aeonian life because they're living during the eons, mm -hmm. technically, right? But generally, Aeonian life is spoken of as those who have a God's, those who are in tune with God, those who are given the life of God. Um, I suppose this is the ultimate of Aeonian life, to know, to know God. That's the end game of Aeonian life. But the Aeonian life itself is nothing more than living with God's mind during a period of time. That is the literal definition of Aeonian life. That really, the question should be asked, what does Aeonian life produce? What is the best aspect of Aeonian life? What, this is not the definition of Aeonian life, to know God. It's the result of Aeonian life. It's the highest expectation we should have for Aeonian life. Okay. What does your process of book writing look like from idea to finished book? Thank you for asking that. I appreciate that because I like to talk about my craft. I don't get the opportunity to do that very much because some people aren't interested in it. Um, it's, it's so funny when people say to me, Martin, I want to be a writer. And they say, what do you think I should write about? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I'm like, if you have to ask that question, what should you write about? You, you should not be a writer. You should be so pressed with something to say. You have something to say so bad that you're dying, you're looking for 
a medium, whether it's paint or clay or words or speaking, that you have to get this thing out. So the first process begins with, I have to say something, I have to say something. And then the next thing is I have to get it down. And the, to, to get it down, the first thing you have to do is not worry about writing the perfect English sentence. This is what writer's block is all about. If anyone suffers from writer's block, you're, what writer's block is performance anxiety. You're just worried about writing the perfect sentence, about doing everything right, and I gotta be smart, I gotta sound funny, I gotta be great. No. The first process is getting your thoughts down as quickly as you can in the most primitive manner, and you have to be willing to write the worst sentence in the English language, the worst paragraph, the worst page. Just write down crap, it doesn't matter, you need to get the ideas down. That's the first thing I do. And sometimes I catch myself trying to craft it in the creative Mm -hmm. part of, of, of the writing and that's a, a danger because then you take 10 minutes to write every sentence and you're analyzing yourself over thinking it where what you need to be doing is getting your thoughts down so the first thing I do is get my thoughts down it's like pulling it's like Michelangelo pulling the marble from the quarry that's the first thing you do to create David you got to get your slab of marble in your workshop right yeah that's half the battle getting that damn piece of rock into your workshop I gotta get my thoughts onto the frickin' computer. I mean, I, and then you take your chisel out, then it's the fun part, then it's the part I enjoy. And it's just actually crafting it into beautifully, beautiful sentences that sing, that you know, people like. Now you have a lot of interesting images in your books. Where, where do those come along in the process? The, those are the last things that I put in a book, but I might actually think of them while I'm writing the book and I'll make a note to myself like this would be a great photograph here, but that's the cream, that's the cherry on the sundae. That's the last the thing I do and I love that part of it more than anything. Uh, but s sometimes I'll have the book cover in my mind though before I even write the book. Okay. Sometimes I'll write a book just so I can put a just so I can get a cover <laughs> out. That's a bad thing when you have the cover in your mind first. I need to write a book based on this great cover idea I have. Yes, <laughs> as long as it works. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend this to anyone, but yeah. Do you eat bread and drink wine in remembrance of the Lord's death? No. What's traditional? I, I drink wine in order to alter my mood. Okay. <laughs> and I eat bread because I love the taste and I just use it as an excuse to convey butter into my mouth. What was your second question? What was your follow up on that? What's traditionally known as communion? Uh, Yes, I know, and people have argued about, in fact, there's another thing I, I disagree with A.E. Nock on, now that you mention it. Nock actually thought that we should be breaking bread. And, and Paul, when Paul talks about it in what, 1 Corinthians, wherever, Paul mentions it, and there's a, some wording there, it's a completely different topic, we could talk about some other time, that whether Paul is passing on a tradition to the body of Christ um, about breaking the bread because Paul recollects Jesus Christ breaking the bread with his disciples on the last Passover and Paul is actually not telling the Corinthians or the body of Christ this is something you need to do he's just saying you need to eat in a manner like this like being thankful and being orderly because the Corinthians were a, they were a rowdy lot and they would come to dinner they would come eating unworthily. They'd all just be chowing down. They wouldn't take time. They wouldn't wait for other people. They would just be at a chow fest, like a pizza. You get a pizza and everybody just starts scarfing it down. Paul said, whoa, 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 whoa. And you know, and so Paul, it's interesting in the wording there, it's not the Lord's dinner. Paul's not passing along this thing called the Lord's supper or the Lord's dinner. He's, this is a lordly dinner. It's used as an adjective. Okay. It's a technicality in, in, in the Greek, but this is the manner in which you're to eat. You're to eat worthily. You're not to come to a meal as a body, being a bunch of pigs, not thinking about other people. You know, the, the whole idea here is we're not here to eat. We're here to fellowship. Okay. So I don't observe it as a rite or a r r ritual one. I don't like to see it done. I, I will do it. In fact, I was at a house. I was at a place at a meeting in California where I was speaking and I was the only speaker and the woman there felt the need to pass around bread and wine and I went along with it. As Paul says, you know, I'll become as a Jew to the Jew and a Greek to the Greek. I don't want to offend anyone. So if somebody thinks it's important and they want to do it, I'll do it. If somebody wants to pray before a meal, I'll shut up and let them pray. I won't say, no, I refuse to thank God before this food. 
I thank God anyway in my heart. You know, I, I think it's a little primitive to have to say it, but you know, if you want to hold hands and do it, I'm in. But I don't think it's ideal. Thank you. What scripture verses direct your life the most? Oh, direct my life. That's a good question. These are great questions. I appreciate being asked these. Um, I'm a literalist, so I'm taking this as a practical question, like which scripture verses direct my life? Which scripture verses tell me what to do? That's a different question than to say which scripture verses are to me the greatest truth, right? And you're, But you're yeah. not asking that question. No. You're asking, like, what informs my day-to-day -day living? Yes. I would say the the one letter in Scripture that I live by is Second Timothy, okay. Because that is Paul's last letter, and he's calling out Timothy as a soldier of the Lord. And I find myself in that position, and he's telling them to do the work of a, an evangelist, herald the word opportunely and inopportunely, suffer evil with the evangel, correctly cut the word of truth. Second Timothy is specifically written for those who find themselves in the call of teacher. And so that letter directs my life more than any other. It's very practical to me. Okay. What are some areas in the scriptures that you wish you had clearer understanding in? <laughs> uh, the, the whole Old Testament, I, I, would, I, I read a book years ago by Andrew Jukes called Types in Genesis. And he dealt with all the, the types of the, like the meal offering, the burn offering, the sin offering, all these different offerings and what they said about Jesus Christ. And I remember being so, wow, it's so great how God had all this in mind with, with, with the offerings way back when. And, and I thought it would be so great to have a mastery of this topic. So I, I kind of wish I still, at one time, I didn't have a mastery of it, but I was, I was conversant in it. I, not anymore, I would have to brush up on it, but I would say I would like to have that on autopilot where I could just access the types of the Old, the Old Testament. But it's not necessary now to know that. And I consider myself an emergency technician of the scriptures, and if somebody's ready to die, and if the eon's about to end, the last thing we need is, well, let me explain to you the types in the scriptures. No, you need to know about the death of Christ for sin, you need to know that the Trinity is a lie, uh, free will is a lie. It's like when the guy come, when the ambulance guy comes at you, and you know, and one arm's over here, one leg's over there. He's not going to ask you about your medical history. He's not going to explain to you the history of bacteria. You hook up an IV to this guy now. That's what I do. He's dying. He's dying over here. We ain't got time to talk about the types in Genesis. Sorry, Andrew Jukes, great book, but don't need it now. We're we're losing light. Maybe let, why don't we crank that sh shade up just a little bit? Forget it. Just tr crank that shit up a little bit. It's getting dark in here. More, 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 more. Oh, oh, yes. The, let there be light. Thank you. Do I have to do everything around here? Yes. <laughs> here we go. I'm answering all the questions. You have to do some no, work you're, you're, you're doing. Woo, the, you're just doing, making me sweat over here. You're doing the hard part, and I, I appreciate your answers. I appreciate the questions. What is your method for digging deep into individual words in the scriptures? Uh, a concordance, for one thing, find out where else the word is used, right? Concordance tells you where else in the scripture, besides the passage you're trying to understand where that word exists. And a great tool is, folks, if you get the concordant literal New Testament in the back, there is a concordant dictionary, and it gives you the Greek word, and what's really helpful is the elements like this is like the skeleton of the word um for instance i'm just randomly looking down at the word purpose it's on page 236 of the concordant dictionary and the greek word is prothesis or prothesis and it's a two-part greek word and the elements are before placing pro is the prefix before and thesis is, is, is placing. So I like then seeing the skeleton is before placing, so it gives a more colorful insight into a word. A purpose is before placing. God has a purpose. He before places things, right? He announces what he's gonna do ahead of time, and he places it before us. So there's so many tools. Number one, concordance. Number two, the back of the concordant or New Testament.
What do you think of Ernest L. Martin? <laughs> um, I am thankful to Ernest Martin. He's deceased. He, he was a big shot. He was a higher up in the Worldwide Church of God. And because of him, many people were led into the work of A.E. Knock because he, as a higher up in the Worldwide Church of God, which we all know is a cult, um, how long has my hair been screwy? The whole time? Somebody should tell me. Oh, sorry. Uh, he led a lot of people out of the Worldwide Church of God into the concordant body of literature, so I'm thankful for that. Um, he has some ideas and teachings that I don't agree with. I don't need to go through all of them. I think he's a good man. He was a pioneer. He led many people into the, the, the truth, led them out of the cult of the Worldwide uh, Church of God. He did some pioneering work in the original location of the temple. In Jerusalem uh, and he has a book on the temple if you go to his website that's run by David Seeloff it's called um what the heck is it called I don't remember Ernest Martin what the heck is the website called what's the organization called I can't think of it I got a mental block anyway ask ELM. ask ELM dot com ask ELM ELM being the initials of Ernest L Martin. He's done great work on the location of the temple, which is important because many people think that the Dome of the Rock would have to be demolished in order for a false temple to be built. But in fact, the Dome of the Rock was not the location of the original temple. It was out on the, like, 200 yards to the east on the, what they call the Afal, which is the ancient site of David's, uh, David's uh, residence. Anyway, I love his scholarship, and I'm glad he led so many people out of the worldwide. Can you explain 1 Peter 4, 5 through 6? No, I can't. It's the only, ver only verse I don't know anything about. No, I don't even know what the verse is. Can you read it? Oh, do you want me to go to it? Yeah, go to it. All right. 1 Peter what? 4. 1 Peter 4 and... Yes? 5 through 6. 5 through 6. The man wants me to explain it. Oh, gosh. Start. Start here. Who shall be rendering an account to him who is holding himself in readiness to judge the living and the dead? For this, for, for this, an evangel is brought to the dead, also that they may be judged. Indeed, according to the human and flesh, it should be living according to God in spirit. <laughs> oh, God, this needs to be an entirely... What, I think the main problem you're having there is an evangel to the dead. That's a hurdle. <laughs> hey, that's a get, hurdle. Get us over the hurdle, Martin. Okay. Whenever dead people are spoken of alive, it's a figure of speech. For instance, in when the great white throne occurs and the dead shall hear his voice, right? There, there's a verse that says, the dead shall he hear the voice. I think it's in Daniel chapter 12. The dead shall hear the voice of God and they shall rise. How can dead people hear the voice of God? They can't. So it's a figure of speech called retention, where we're calling those who were recently dead, we're calling them dead to differentiate those from those who have been alive. Um, is holding in readiness, judging, he's going to judge the living and the dead. For this, an evangel is brought to the dead. Oh, I, I have a note here. And the note is, when raised. He's going to bring an evangel to the dead when they're raised. But they're called dead to differentiate them from those who will have been raised from the dead most recently compared to those who have already raised from okay. the dead. Because you can't preach an evangel to dead people. They don't listen. They don't pay attention. If you've ever been, been to a funeral home and tried to talk to the guest of honor, they don't respond very well. Their ears are not working. Their ears are not working. They can't understand you. And it's a frustrating enterprise. I don't recommend it to anyone. And I don't recommend teaching an evangel to the dead. This is a figure of speech. And it's even looking forward to the figure of speech of retention, where those who were, were the title of those who were recently dead is retained to differentiate them from those who are alive. We have one final question. We have one final question. Thank you for joining us in Studio <sighs> 223. Thank you, Martin, for your answers. You're welcome. The cues were adequate. The cues the were adequate. You, the cues were amazing. I mean, what a... Making me sweat over here, Wes. The A's were amazing. Thank you. Final question. Do you prefer blondes or brunettes? Well... Um, do I prefer blondes or brunettes? That's a great question. I, all my life I've preferred brunettes. 
because black is my, my favorite color because it's so basic my two favorite colors are colors are black and white right so i've always loved dark hair because to me it's more mysterious it's more mm, it's more dangerous <laughs> right it is dangerous and we, we associate blonde hair i'm of course, I'm assuming you're talking about on women. I'm just assuming that because I don't that care. That was the assumption. I don't care what color a guy's hair is. I absolutely don't care. Women, I'm extremely interested in this topic. I'm glad you asked that. Yes, I, I prefer brunettes. But in my, in my advanced years, I have come to appreciate the wonders and the marvel of blondes. I used to be a Ginger Grant fan, only Ginger, right? The Ginger Mary Ann question, the classic. Right up there with Coke or Pepsi, Chevy or Ford. But in my mature years, I've come to see, I was all about Ginger, I had, I had to have Ginger, I had to have Ginger. But I realize now the value of the girl next door, the Mary Ann type, right? That in fact, there's actually more there more to Marianne than there is to Ginger. Ginger is so shallow, but shallowness when it's in a skin tight dress has great appeal. <laughs> I, I've grown out of it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I appreciate brunettes and blondes equally as well, with a slight tendency to favor brunettes. Still, thank you. Yes. We appreciate thank your you. time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for giving out these questions. I can tell you can tell the intelligence of some person by the caliber of their questions. Thank you. We'll be back tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, one with who knows what.